Shalom, my friends. Wonderful to be with you. We are in Israel, in this land who is blossoming and growing all the time. There is so many things happening here and it's beautiful. And you remember the 70 years of um, the state of Israel. And we find now this uh, last week that there is uh, an amazing thing that happening in Israel is like now there is more Jewish people in the land than outside. This is amazing. And today we have a friend, Rivka Lambert Adler, and this is wonderful to be with her. We are going to speak about redemption. We are going to look at redemption, like how we think, how it is in, for the Christians, and we are moving into the Jewish way of looking at redemption, which is very exciting. And we are going to see some very beautiful thing in the Bible. Rivka, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank this you for inviting me. Let us shake hands. <laughs> this is Jews and no, no Jews. This is Jews <laughs> and Christian working together. This is already a miracle because it wasn't like that 50 years ago, which was very rare. And 100 years ago, it was even worse. Right. So this is just amazing. So Rivka is a Bible and prophecy watcher. She's a reporter on Breaking Israel News. We know about Breaking Israel News is with uh, Tuli Weiss and also with Jolie. Donna Jolie, who is working with the Torah for the Nations. Okay, let me just, we're working on a project called Yeshiva for the Nations. Yeshiva, yeshiva is a Hebrew word that means a, a place people go and study Torah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about is how people from the nations are now suddenly interested in hearing more about what the Jews have been involved with for all of these right. millennia. And so um, so I'm the program director for Yeshiva for the Nations, working with Donna Jolay, who's my Christian partner. And we are working on bringing Torah to people from the nations who are interested, which like you said before, totally new in the world. Yes. Whenever has there been an interest like there is now? Exactly. So we want to speak today about redemption. I know I was looking at redemption in, maybe I can find even the what they are saying. Redemption is like the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing of debt. And for the Christian, really, it's like action of saving or being saved from sin or from error or from evil. So this is very much the Christian view. What I love about the Jewish view is something much more global. So for the Jewish people, the way that we understand redemption is that it is a process of perfecting the world. It does not just concern the Jewish people. The Hebrew word for redemption is geula. And geula is certainly relevant for the Jewish people, but geula is geula for the whole world. When, when we get to the part where the world the part of history where the world is in its redeemed state, there, the entire world will be redeemed. And there are signs that the Bible gives us and that God has given us that redemption is coming closer. And these three that we're going to speak about today have to do with what we say in Hebrew, kibbutz goliath, the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, which is clearly happening. Um, the so Aliyah is part of that? Yes, is absolutely. It? absolutely. Aliyah, the, the word Aliyah means to ascend because Israel is considered, as you know, the, the highest, not if you measure it like a mountain, but the, spiritually the highest land in the world. So people immigrate to Israel. We don't just say that we immigrated, like, but we made Aliyah. We, we ascended. We, ascend. we ascended. Mm -hmm. um, and that has all kinds of spiritual implications for what happens to you once you get into this land. So the fact that the Jewish people, after 2,000 years, have returned to the land of Israel is a big sign that redemption is underway. A second big sign is the idea that the land itself responds in a unique way to the Jewish people. So there's the very famous passage from Mark Twain when he visited this place before the Jews returned in big numbers and it was desolate. And he Which wrote was about in it. 18, in, in the, the end of the 19th, 19th century, century sometime. Yeah. But now we're in Israel. On the way here, all you see is greenery and so forth, but even more so the productivity of the land in fruits and vegetables. So in any grocery store, in any marketplace, you see big piles of produce that were grown here. For 2,000 years, that wasn't true. You couldn't grow anything here as it was all just sand and rocks 
um, and so forth. And when you see the pictures from before and after, this it's is It's extraordinary, just, yes, because so God is fulfilling his promise to make the land flourish, to prepare the land to receive the Jewish people. So it goes together, those first two things. And the third thing is what we were alluding to before, that all of a sudden people who are not Jewish want to learn about God's wisdom in the way that Jews study. And that is where I spend most of my time. That phenomenon is also a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We know in um, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, where it talks about that at the end of days, people from the nations will cling to the garment of a Jew. Which is your right? book. Which is, which I'll is just mention, yes, yes. that I actually wrote a book called Ten from the Nations, Torah Awakening Among Non-Jews. And it's the story of 37 different people who are not Jewish, who at some point in their, um, in their religious journey started getting in interested not for the intention of becoming Jewish, but what does the Torah have to teach them as non-Jews? So that's what this is. Plus there's 12 chapters at the end of the book written by Jewish people like myself who are trying to respond to that, um, to that desire for, um, for Torah because as a Jewish person, I used to think that the Torah was the exclusive property of the Jews. And I think a lot of Jewish people still think that. But because redemption is a process that's unfolding, we see it differently. I see it differently. And now I see that God gave the Jewish people the Torah, entrusted it to us while all the rest of history was playing out, but that there would come a time, and we're in that time, and you know this very well, right, where the nations would start to say, ah, now we're interested. Um, so my husband and I are very involved. He's a rabbi, and most of his career he's been teaching Jewish people. But in recent years, we have been responding to this desire of non-Jews. And very often when, when we're working with them or teaching them or something, somebody in the group will say to us, they want to thank us on behalf of all the non-Jews in the world that the Jewish people have preserved and protected um, the Torah so that it would still be in the world when they were ready. And that's the process that we see unfolding that I see in my work every day. And it's like growing and growing and growing. Yes. It's not disappearing, it's like it's getting bigger. And okay, so I think you know, you know how we love the, the Bible and in Hebrew because there is so much. And I was reading the, the beautiful verses like Isaiah 11, 12 in English. And I'm like, okay, let us go to see. And it's, it's beautiful. Let us read it in, in English. It's like, he will uphold a signal to the nations and assemble the banished of Israel. Okay, and gather the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. And I'm like, okay, let me read it in, in Hebrew because I don't know, it's like, I want to know really the root. I want to have the flavor of what God really wants right. to say. And I read it in, in uh, Hebrew, slowly, slowly. V'nasa nes lagoim ve'asaf nidrei Israel. So it's like he's going to send something. And Ness, Ness, you know, that is like miracle. But I was looking also, it means um, a wonder and it means marvel. Okay? So it's like God is sending to Lagoim. That's the interesting the part nation. of this verse. Exactly. Right. Sending a miracle, we can say, or a sign, a banner is also. Also, but also, he's calling the nation's attention to something. That's it. Right. Exactly. Right. So what's interesting about that is what we were speaking about redemption, not just being redemption for the Jewish people. It's not, it is not just understood as a personal redemption, although that's also true. But if redemption is redemption for the whole world, then people from the nations need to be in on it. And in order for them to be in on it, they have to know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this verse is speaking to the idea that God is going to, as it were, wake up, mm -hmm. start noticing, I'm doing something here. I want you to pay attention because I'm bringing my children home to the land and, um, and it's, gonna, it's gonna have implications for you, even, though, even if you don't live in Israel, even if you're not Jewish, because the world is shifting and God wants the nations to be part of that. And so he's, he's making uh, a message specifically tailored for them. There's something I want to say about the verse that we spoke about before that, mm -hmm. 
there's a verse in Deuteronomy, and I have to say that I learned this from my husband, that it's in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5, mm -hmm. and it talks about God's promise to bring the Jews back into the land. Now, here's what's fascinating about this. We understand this to also be rele relevant for our time right now, and here's what's so fascinating. So if you count the number of verses that are in the first five books of Moses, mm -hmm. okay, there's approximately the number of 5,888. Okay, this verse that, let me just read it in English if yeah, I can, yeah, this yeah, exact sure, verse in Deuteronomy sure. chapter 30, verse five, and Hashem your God will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed and you shall possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your fathers. Okay, so that's clearly all about coming back to the land, about Aliyah and so forth. Here's what's fascinating. In, if you start from the very first verse, mm -hmm. it is the 5,708th verse in the Torah. Now, why is that important? You may know already where I'm going with this, but so Jews measure time by Hebrew years. The Hebrew year 5,708 corresponds to the English year 1948. 1948, when the Jewish people declared that Israel was a state, when it was under Jewish dominion, once again after 2,000 years, and that is the fulfillment of this verse that now... Which is the ness, which is the miracle. This is the banner correct. saying, hey guys, look, and because you know, even after when it's written there, and assembled the banish of Israel, okay? So the name is Nidrei, and I looked, and they were saying they're rejected. And it's exactly what we've done as the Goim, as the nations. We rejected Israel, saying you are going to go like exile and you are going to disappear. And suddenly, 1948, this nation is back, right, right the beginning. But it was like, that's it. This is a big ness. This is a big miracle that we have in front of us. But the thing for you, it might not be. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a big miracle. But for us, we had all our theology, Christian theology, where we are now Israel, blah, 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 which is the replacement theology. And suddenly this is put away because Israel is rising again. So because every biblical verse, at least in the first five books, we believe was written by God, it exists on multiple levels, right? So certainly what you're saying is true. The way that I hear it as a Jewish person is that we got kicked out of this place. You know, we misbehaved. We lost our temple twice. We got we got exiled twice, um, but that the, the miracle would be that after 2,000 years of living among the nations who were not always so nice to us, um, that God would remember us and that the rejection um, would not be forever and ever, but that God would redeem us, restore us to our land. And that's, that's the miraculous period of time that you and I are living through, that if you think, you, we were talking before about 100 years ago, before the state of Israel was established, um, even during the middle of the Holocaust, let's say, or, or 100 years before that, or 1,000 years before that, although Jews always had Jerusalem and the idea of returning to the land of Israel always in our prayers, it didn't seem so realistic. So it was going to be something that happened in some other lifetime, but now we're living it. Now we're living what it. What in it? Yeah. So I was, when we first came to Israel eight years ago and I went to Ulpan, I went to full-time Hebrew school and I'm sitting in my class in Jerusalem studying Hebrew with Jewish people who were originally spread out all over the world and now we are restored and back in Jerusalem. It was very, um, we say in Hebrew, it was very emotional mm -hmm. for me to realize I'm living it. I'm living it. It's actually happening. Uh, even when you are speaking about the blossoming of the land, it's not just like you are eating, you are even exporting things. I was looking yesterday like flowers. You are exporting so many flowers and you, you know how to do like the the water, the drop irrigation. Well, I personally don't know how, but... <laughs> <laughs> But like the country right. has given so much, you know, and like the solar panel right. is like, again, it's like something so amazing that this is normal now for us to have a solar panel, but right. it was not before. Right. So let me just go back one step and mm -hmm. say that God charged the Jewish people with being a light to the nations. Okay. And that means a few different things. One of the things that it means is that the Jewish people 
that God gave the Jewish people the job of helping humanity, helping the nations with their practical problems. So things are developed in this country in almost a super technology and so forth, in almost a supernatural way. And those good ideas are exported to other countries where they have the same climate conditions or they have the same lack of natural resources or whatever that they can duplicate what we did here. I think that I'm very proud to be Israeli and I think that a lot of Israelis work very hard to invent these things, but I also think that we have uh, what we call in Hebrew siyata deshmaya, we get help from heaven so that we can solve problems that are not just problems for us in Israel, but are problems for other countries and export that knowledge because that is the fulfillment, partial fulfillment of us doing the job that God gave us to do to help the rest of humanity. When it's amazing because you find that normal, but if you look like, if we look at Iran, they are doing some terrible thing to fight people, to kill, do you understand? Mm. But here in Israel, it's like, you have a problem and you want to solve it, and you solve it, and then you go to help the world. I mean, you see, at Salah, I mean, right. so many people, and they are not just helping here in Israel, they go out of the nation to say, okay, I want, I want to help you. I think that God wove something special into the Jewish character, not just to invent these things, but to want to be happy to give it something about the, the nature of the country. And you know what? Up until 70 years ago, we couldn't do that. We, if we were persecuted in, in some European country or in some Muslim country, we were too busy surviving. Mm -hmm. But that, those days are over, thank God. And now we're back in our land. And now the potential that God put into the Jewish people and the responsibility, which we take very seriously, that God put it gave to the Jewish people is being realized and we can see it every day in all these examples of things that, that we do that help other people. And the other thing now, the, the third one, I mean, no, we want to, to remind you, the first one is like Aliyah, the gathering of all the Jewish people in the land of Israel. The second one is like you see the land blossoming and is beautiful. It's like the land is responding. Right, exactly. It's responding. It's not just a land. It's alive. It's something amazing. And the third thing is the, the goyim, is the nation who wants the Torah. So do you want to speak a bit about that? Because yes, you because I love this topic. <laughs> and you're totally in, in, in it. I'm totally in it. So I didn't know what was going on until a few years ago. But because of the work that I did for Breaking Israel News, people who were not Jewish, but who were connected in some way to the land of Israel and so forth, they would come and visit and they would say, oh, we want to meet you. And I would meet them. They would tell me their stories of, they're studying the Torah portion of the week. They're studying Hebrew. They are looking, looking at the Bible in a way that they said they, they never used to growing up because they, they sort of skipped the whole first part of the Bible and mostly focused on that. And so I realized that the, another part of being or Goyim, of being a light to the nations, means that the Jewish people have a responsibility. I never saw this before, before the, I learned it from the nations. We have a responsibility to teach and to respond to that desire. And there are a lot of misconceptions about what's permissible and what's not permissible because it wasn't safe to do this if you think about um, Jews living in ghettos in, in Christian Europe or in Muslim countries, nobody wanted to hear what we had to say. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but it wasn't safe. There were times when it wasn't safe for Jews to study Torah among Jews because of persecution and so forth. But th those days, thank God, are all over. And now we're in a time where the Jewish people need to step up to the plate and find ways to teach people from the nations, what we have been studying for 2,000 mm -hmm. years. So right now, if you're a Jewish person and you want to study Torah and you want to come to Israel and study Torah, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of different places you can go. If you're not a Jewish person, there are very few. They are beginning to develop some online resources so that people from all over the world can um, can access them, but there's nothing like learning Torah in Israel. Yeah. And so the, one of the projects that I'm working with, Yeshiva for the Nations, we are developing in-person 
opportunities for people who come from the nations, come to Israel during Passover, during Sukkot, during those times of year where the Bible says it's, you know, and Sukkot is, a, is very connected. Mm -hmm. It's the holiday, the time of year that is, um, connects Israel and people from the nations. So we're planning these programs during the week of, of the holiday of Sukkot that we will have Jewish teachers teaching people from the nations aspects of the Torah that they may be curious about, um, that they have never had a chance to learn from Jewish people. And right now, um, Yeshiva for the Nations is one of the first programs on the ground to provide that kind of education. It's very exciting. I think it's very exciting because I, I agree with you, like things with email and internet is great because some people are too busy and they, and they are far away. Or they away. can't travel. Exactly. But like, there is something in the land that where after you've been there, you can export it to somebody else and tell them, you know, this is really something to be in the land, in the land of Israel. So the, the rabbis tell us that the very land of Israel makes a person wise. I agree. <laughs> and, and we're both sitting in Israel sniffing this air, and we, we know that it affects us on a spiritual level. You can learn intellectually anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. and, and that's a good place to start. But you know that there are tour guides that, that take people in Israel with a Bible in their hands. And they'll say, okay, everybody open your Bible to whatever chapter, whatever verse, read that verse. Now look over this hilltop because that's where that happened. And so- You need something to the person. Is because that you you're right on home. the scene. It's not just some words that you're reading on a page. You're right there in, in the, the location where it happened. It, it has to affect you differently. And not only that, there is so much things because when you speak about that, it reminds me of Fran. She lost her parents very, uh, like one after the other, very close to each other. And she came here quite soon after. And, and I knew that God was going to heal, I mean, like do a process in her to comfort her quicker because she was coming in this land. And it happens to her. And it's written again in the word, like, you know, you would be comforted from Zion. And she was so close to here that she, had, she was comforted quicker than if she had been only in France. And I was like, wow, this is again amazing to see that. You know, we, I, I don't want to lose this idea of the process of redemption, mm -hmm. that um, it isn't something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. And we are, I think, by all opinions, we are in the process of redemption. And not everybody's aware of it yet. Mm -hmm. um, we're speaking about it as if, because we have been privileged to be able to see some of the early signs, like the Jews returning to the land, like the land blossoming, like the nations turning to the Jewish people and saying, oh, we're curious about this Torah thing. Teach us some more about that. Um, but those are early signs. There are so many prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. Of many um, more. Many, many more prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled from this place. Um, and so I think that the message I would like for people to get is that the way the, way the Jewish people see Geula, the way the Jewish people see redemption, is that God gave us sort of a map and said, when you start mm -hmm. seeing these things happening, I'm, I'm moving history forward. I'm working on redemption. And a lot of people see time as going on forever and ever and ever. And that is not the Jewish view. The Jewish view is that there's a built-in end and we're rapidly coming to that time. Um, and so all of these things are beginning to happen. And the, the return of the Jews to the land, the land flourishing and the interest from people in nations in Torah are things that we can practically see every day. We do not yet, for example, know who the messianic figure is. We haven't met him yet. At least we haven't <laughs> met him yet. Um, we haven't seen the temple, the third and eternal temple being rebuilt. We have seen, you mentioned at the beginning that this idea that the majority of the world's Jews are living here, but certainly not all of the Jews are here yet. There's still a lot of stages that have to play out, but we're in the process. And I would love for people to, um, to understand and to have that framework to be able to look at Israel and know it's going on. It's mm -hmm. going on right now. Just, we're living through it. I know. It's just amazing. I hope that you really enjoy this mini nuggets about redemption. It's a huge topic and we will carry on speaking about these things 
Rifa, thank you for thank coming. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Shalom, dear friends. We carry on looking at the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments. And do you remember how we say it in Ivrit, in Hebrew? Aseret Advarim. Now we are looking today at the Seventh Commandment. And you remember five, which is towards God, and five, who is towards men. And now we are looking at the Seventh, which is do not commit adultery. And in Ivrit is lo tin af. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the story of the Jewish people in the Sinai, you receive the commandment of God. It was like a contract of marriage. It's called in Hebrew ketubah. And so it was a, a contract, really. It was like a marriage between God and the Jewish people. So when we commit adultery or when we commit, when we do a sin, is like we are breaking something between God and us. It's like there is no more faithfulness because we are turning against Him. And we sometimes we can feel really bad about that. Say, oh no, I have been again really wrong with God and maybe He's going to forget about me. So there is two things in our hands. We have to think, yes, this is very important, but also in another way, sin is just a passing moment. And so God is bringing repentance. He makes this amazing uh, things on earth, I would say, that we can repent, we can turn back to Him and say, we are sorry. And like when we commit adultery, something has been broken, but if we are really honest and we come back to Him, or we come back to the person we've been wrong with, we can be back to normal and we can build again something but you can see loyalty and fidelity is so important and not to betray somebody is very important because we are breaking something very deep inside of this relationship. Now we look at this beautiful commandment, which is do not commit adultery. And in Ivrit, in Hebrew, is lo tin af. That's it, we've done it again today. See you next week. Bye. Rivka, thank you for coming and I want to tell you 10 from the nation. This is a beautiful book to really see what God is doing all around the nations and that we are turning our eyes towards Israel and this is just amazing. From Rivka and from me, bye and see you next week.